At this stage, we come to the annual Golton Lecture, which has been given uh, ever since 1914. And it is the, one of the real high points of the Institute's annual conference. This year, it's our 101st Golton Lecture. Uh, and it's entitled Eugenics, the Unethical Trump Card. Um, it's going to be given by Professor Barthen Knoppers, and um, in tr tradition, we don't have questions at the end of the talk. So she has a nice long slot to tell us about all her work in the area of uh, bioethics um, and her thoughts about eugenics and ethical issues. Bartha is the director of uh, the Center of Genomics and Policy at the Department of Human Genetics in McGill University. Um, although she herself was born in uh, the Netherlands. Her career has focused on fields of medical law and biomedical ethics. And for many years, she has been studying issues of societal importance, such as biobanks, stem cells, cloning, human biotechnologies, genetic research on populations, assisted reproduction, neonatal screening, pharmacogenomics, rare diseases, and the future of public health. Since um, 2001, she has held the Canada Research Chair in Law and Medicine at the University of Montreal. Uh, and she also has held uh, a chair in France, uh, the Pierre Fermat Chair. She has many degrees. She's a graduate of uh, the University of McMaster for her BA, the University of Alberta for her MA, of McGill for uh, the LLB and the BCL, and of Cambridge University uh, UK for a Doctor of Laws, and the Sorbonne Paris for a PhD. So I think uh, she has been fantastically thoroughly educated. <laughs> She was admitted to the Bar of Quebec uh, in 1985, and uh, subsequently she was named uh, Governor and Advocatus Emeritus. But she has also chaired many uh, international committees that considered ethical issues in uh, genetics and genomics over the last three decades or so, and uh, we were discussing how I have known her for about 30 years, probably. So she was uh, the chair of the International Ethics Committee of the Human Genome Organization, and it was one of the earlier ethics committees uh, that was uh, organized and, and considered many issues in genetics as they arose, as genetics uh, changes all the time and, and new issues arise, as we were hearing, for example, about the facial um, uh, research. Uh, she's also been... Uh, uh, involved with the Bioethics Committee of, the, of UNESCO and involved in drafting the Universal Declaration of Human Genome and Human Rights, which again is obviously a very important matter that we have to probably keep an eye on because again these things change all the time as the science changes. Uh, she has founded many projects like P3G, the Population Project in Genomics, Cartagene, which is a Quebec population study, uh, and has uh, served on the board of uh, Genome Canada. Um, and uh, she, is, uh, she has had four honorary doctorates uh, and is an officer of the Order of Canada. So, I think you can see that we have an extremely eminent Galton lecturer, and I now want to uh, give the platform to Bartha to deliver the Galton lecture. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is with some trepidation and humility that I address you today. I'm a former scholar of poetry, a social scientist, uh, a law professor reborn in the faculty of human genetics at McGill University. The quixotic nature of the subject of eugenics of the Galton Lecture, which you've asked me to address, is best suited, probably, as you'll see, for a true genetic scientist. <laughs> 
Yet I feel privileged to exploit my eclectic career, uh, perhaps to bring a more citizen-oriented uh, perspective. The main purpose of my uh, lecture is to argue, if not to plead, for an end to the label of historically laden terms such as eugenic as an unethical trump card, thereby either inflaming or, if not stopping, all public debate. So laden with social, ethical, and legal import, this concept should not be trivialized or cheapened, especially in public debates where, like Jungian archetypes, it stirs the collective conscious and unconscious. Serialist poetry is where I began my academic pursuits. And serialist poetry is a tool that allowed artists and poets to break free from the conventional norms imposed by tradition. I forgot to put my eugenic slide up, but I'm sure you've seen it before. Um, painters such as Salvador Dali and poets such as André Breton juxtaposed non-connected ideas, objects, words, and images in order to break free from convention so as to explore, understand, or portray new visions of reality. The political realities of the 70s, however, led me to forsake my doctorate in literature, where I was comparing the power of surrealist um, revolution in Caribbean poetry with that of Quebec, and decided to change into the more politically active discipline of law. If law is seen as a tool for social reform and justice, why not examine its potential to respond to emerging technologies that affect humans and humanity at the most intimate of all levels, that of human reproduction and genetic choice? So to address the most obvious arguments, or they're really more reactions, such as playing God, slippery slope, unnatural, and eugenic, the kind of words or reactions that you hear in public discourse, I will begin with the in vitro fertilization assisted birth of Louise Brown in 1978. I have divided my presentation into four parts, covering the four decades since her birth, and will conclude with some thoughts on the potential role of human rights to enrich the debate on eugenics with the arrival of gene editing, which I heard is your subject for next year's Galton Lecture. But as preamble and true to a lawyer's insistence on definitions, a brief definitional scoping exercise. So let's begin with the present. In her book, The New Genetics, Selective Breeding in an Era of Reproductive Technologies, Judith Dar presents what she calls the new eugenics in relation to assisted reproduction technologies. She defines the new genetics, uh, eugenics, sorry, as collective procreative deprivation, or again, to quote her, selective breeding. She claims that this is due to a lack of affordability and availability and to the discretionary withholding of assisted reproduction technologies from the less wealthy, the less white, the less able-bodied, the less traditional, and the less politically wealthy. And by chance this morning, I was watching the BBC, great pleasure when I come to the UK, and they had a couple from IVF this morning on their eighth attempt talking about not only their personal experiences, but also the cost. So I think she has a point. Her novel insights and recommendations for the democratization of assisted reproductive technologies through greater availability and accessibility add fuel to my conclusion on the hitherto unexplored avenues of human rights in the debate on eugenics and reproductive medicine and genetics. There are other more well-known uh, definitions, such as eugenics as procreative beneficence, a form of liberal eugenics or neo-eugenics, allowing parents via autonomous choices to maximize the well-being of their future children through pre-implantation and prenatal selection or through gene enhancement therapies for children. In other words, the sum total of voluntary individual improvement of the human race. 
The more classical forms of eugenics date back to the negative eugenics of the Nazi legacy through the prevention of the reproduction of the unfit. Or positive eugenics defined as improvement of the inborn qualities or stock of a race or population. And more recently, even dysgenics, that of degeneration. A modern example being the survival and reproduction of those who would have died or been selected out to disease, but now can reproduce thanks to medical treatment. I think diabetes is a, is a well-known example. Sir Robert Edwards, the pioneer of in vitro fertilization, was himself a member of the Eugenic Society in Britain. His IVF technique is responsible for the birth of over five million children worldwide, and it is with him that our four decades journey begins. In 1979, I had the privilege of interviewing Robert Edwards while studying at Trinity College in Cambridge. If ever there were scientists under attack for playing with the so-called immutable laws of nature, for playing God, for creating designer babies, Steptoe and Edwards were the target. 30 years out from the horrors of the Nazi experiments and barely rid of the last forced sterilization laws of the 70s, which by the way we had in Canada and Sweden and the United States, the label of eugenics weighed heavily on IVF as did the specter of human reproductive cloning. At that time, work on my doctoral thesis on reproductive technologies sought to prepare physicians and researchers for these new responsibilities. Gracious and giving of their time to a mere student, Steptoe and Edwards were very forthcoming about their fears and the pressures of failures and outcomes even after the successful birth of Louise Brown but they were very passionate about helping infertile couples. In industrialized countries, and unbeknownst to most, since usually as a hidden stigma, involuntary infertility is at 16% of persons of reproductive age. Today, IVF for just genetic indications stands at 10% of all IVF treatments. Now, in 1984, the UK Warnock Commission report adopted what is commonly known as a pragmatic and principled approach, leading to the 1990 Human Fertilization and Embryology Act and the creation of a regulatory agency, the Human Fertility and Embryology Agency. Other countries, however, left IVF to professional guidance or adopted specific laws. Germany, for example, adopted the human, sorry, the Embryo Procreation, uh, Embryo Protection Act in 1990. And the NIH adopted a no federal funding of embryo research model. Paradoxically, by removing federal funding, it abandoned oversight and the private sector largely took over in the US. Moreover, countries who adopted technology specific legislation on reproductive and genetic choice often had the perverse effect of creating IVF tourism or led scientists to work around the very technical definitions with arbitrary limits as to when human life began. It should be also be remembered that the deterministic single gene Mendelian model of human genetics was greatly influential at that time. One's genome was understood as being a blueprint, the book of life. In addition, the larger issues of reproductive choice, including prenatal decisions and abortion, affected the acceptability and availability of IVF. So pervasive and so inflammatory was the dogma of non-interference with the human genome, the human genome seen as static, that 25 years later, the 2005 debate at the United Nations on human reproductive cloning did not achieve sufficient consensus to go beyond a simple declaration, a simple declaration on human cloning. At this time, not to be forgotten, was the emergence of sociobiology as espoused by Wilson in the late 1970s. Sociobiology 
promoted the concept that social behaviors are biologically influenced and encoded within our genes and shaped by the forces of evolution. Biosocial science prompted the American Eugenics Society to change its name to the Society for the Study of Social Biology. Stephen Jay Gold and Lee Wong Ten were quick to qualify this social biology field as deterministic and as perpetuating eugenic ideologies that sought to legitimize racial and social hierarchies. This decade also witnessed the attempt to promote property approaches for genetic materials via patenting and notions of personal ownership in genetic data. Thus, while it began with the novelty of IVF, it continued with women's reproductive rights in the Roe and Wade abortion decision in the United States and by the arrival of genetic testing in the prenatal area of amniocentesis. This first decade following the IVF creation of human life can best be described as a debate on bio-identity on the genetic self. So turning to the decade of 1985 to 1995, it's often forgotten that genetics was already enshrined in public health since the 1960s in the form of neonatal screening. Even today, these programs are seen as one of the 10 most important public health achievements. Until recently, to qualify as a genetic screening, that is, as a test administered to an asymptomatic population to find at-risk individuals to be treated, the WHO had four standard criteria in force pretty well since 1968. One, it had to be an important health problem. It had to be a test with sufficient sensitivity and specificity. It had to be affordable and the condition had to be treatable. Long deemed as in the best interest of the newborn, these programs are now facing the possible introduction of whole genome sequencing as a new screening tool. Population genomics and interest in human diversity appeared just as the Human Genome Project took off in the early 1990s. Indeed, this decade was characterized by this most ambitious international endeavor. As chair of the International Ethics Committee of the newly created Human Genome Project or organization, the question was how to conduct the principal conduct of genetic research. All of the guidance of the Human Genome Organization for the next 20 years attempted to address the following concerns. The concerns that human genome research could lead to discrimination against, and we saw some slides on that earlier, against and as well as stigmatization of individuals and population and be used to promote racism. Loss of access to discoveries for research purposes through patenting and commercialization. Reduction of human beings to their DNA sequences and attribution of social and other human problems to genetic conditions. Lack of privacy and lack of respect for values, tradition, and integrity of populations, families, and individuals. An inadequate engagement of the scientific community with the public in the planning and conduct of genetic research. One of the most enduring legacies, however, the SNP consortium that's coming back today was that in contrast to a privately funded endeavor headed up by Greg Ventner, the SNP consortium put together uh, its international data in the public domain. The notion of building a commons of data was exemplified in the Bermuda Principles on Intellectual Property that are being revisited today as we enter the era, hopefully, of open science. And you can see uh, Greg Bentner and Francis Collins, as well as some very interesting um, covers of Time magazine uh, as well. This ideal of the human genome at the level of human, humanity, as a common heritage of humanity, finds its origins in the principle of international law first espoused by Hugo Grotius. This is the international law that underlies the law of the sea and the law of space. What does that mean, the common heritage of humanity? 
Well, the components are that utilization must be peaceful, access must be open, sharing must be equal, and administration be in the interest of the common welfare. So this international concept stems from the need to prevent ownership of things of communal interest and to preserve for the future things that are of international interest, a form of public trust. Interestingly, however, this same decade witnessed the arrival of wrongful birth and wrongful life cases. Wrongful birth cases are taken by parents claiming that but for the negligence of the physician, the child with a genetic condition would not have been conceived or allowed to go to term. Wrongful life cases taken by the child claim that but for the negligence of the physician, he or she would not have been conceived at all. Some of these cases were successful, usually the parental wrongful birth suits where they could prove a genetic malpractice. The wrongful life cases have rarely succeeded. The rationale is that it is impossible to measure the impaired existence of a child against non-existence as a child would not exist at all. And this even where there is proven fault on the part of the physician. Interestingly, around this time, both France and the UK legislated that children could not sue their mothers for reproductive genetic choices. Finally, the discovery of the gene for Huntington's Korea in 1992 sparked anew the debate on possible genetic discrimination in insurance, as we saw this morning, and on predictive medicine and possible obligations on family members to warn each other. Debates that continue today, the am I my brother's keeper debate, we call it. Another landmark, if not iconic event, was the reproductive cloning of, quote, viable offspring derived from fetal and adult <coughs> mammalian cells. That is the birth of Dolly, the first cloned mammal. Again, I had the privilege of interviewing Ian Wilmot, as you see here, a most self-effacing and forthright researcher and quite unprepared for the tumult that followed. So notorious was Dolly that perhaps more than Louise Brown, she entered into popular culture. And I have to admit, I used, often used Dolly to explain to customs officials um, when they asked what I was doing and they didn't quite get um, bio, biotechnology, ethics and law, didn't sound, it didn't sound like a right answer to them in order to get into, uh, and then they would say, well, aren't you a lawyer? And then I would say, yes. And then they say, well, where are you going? And I would say, well, I'd say Los Angeles. And they say, when are you coming back? And I would say, well, 24 hours. Are you getting paid? And I would say, no, I'm a law professor. And then they said, well, what does it really mean what you do? And I would say, Dolly. And they all say, ah, oh, Dolly. And so you could see how something uh, so complicated was understood uh, in popular culture at that time. Now, Dolly was followed by the early Star Wars series with its morality dilemmas, the claims of Raelians, particularly in Quebec, of possible human reproductive cloning, and later um, the movie Gattaca, which my students always bring up. In fact, our own children keep saying that I'm involved in Gattaca, which sort of predicts the dire consequences of genetic manipulation into the human psyche. What then, turning to the third decade, um, uh, were the, were the uh, events that, that uh, uh, illustrated the multifaceted components of eugenics. Well, this third decade is largely um, about data disclosure and data release, so continuing the tradition started by the Human Genome Project. Genome-wide association studies we heard and genome sequencing became the new tools for data mining. And the focus shift to understanding common variants in complex uh, diseases, on the networks of pathways, as we saw, contributing to disease risk, susceptibility, and health. The genetic self in the genome comments was thereby expanded to include the quantified, the digital self. And as the sequence map of the human genome was completed in 2003, 
attention began to turn to applying this map, to finding the addresses for the sequences and to gather understanding on what these sequences were saying. Data-intensive science was not without its detractors, creating barriers to the new infrastructures necessary to support discovery science. We saw twice already uh, planning beginning for the building of population uh, cohorts, biobanks, and databases representative of a given heterogeneous population. UK Biobank, Estonia Biobank, and so on. Such efforts were um, necessary to serve as a form of infrastructure science for discovery science. And in these epidemiological efforts, participants were acting more as citizens, uh, providing data and samples over time, with no immediate personal benefit. So quite a different model from the clinical trials drug devices model. Ethics committees, however, were accustomed to clinical trial requests with their attendant interventionist dangers of drugs devices and often applied ultra-protectionist, inappropriate risk benefit standards to the ethics review of these biobanks. It proved difficult, extremely difficult, to replace specific consent to a disease study with the broad consent necessary for participation in biobanks and population databases for future unspecified research. Specific limited consent was the sine qua non in research since the Nuremberg Code and the Helsinki Declaration. But for these efforts to succeed, data could not be specific, anonymized, or limited in time or to a specific disease. Longitudinal biobanking meant just that. You follow real people over time across different environments and socioeconomic and demographic conditions. And so you need ethics approval for future unspecified research. Respect, however, for autonomy and privacy were seen as being in jeopardy. The European Privacy Directive, however, on the protection of individuals with regard to the processing of, of personal data and the free movement of such data of 1995 required proof of equivalency of privacy protection if you were going to share data between countries or overseas or outside of Europe and so on. Citizens understood this new form of infrastructure science and accepted broad consents. Having such population genomic data held the promise to be able for healthcare, universal healthcare systems to stratify into pub populations, subpopulations, and target uh, resources. In the rare disease community, patients began to advocate for more data sharing and access, and this across borders. And it was interesting to see with the, with the pictures and so on uh, in the presentations today how, and if you talk and work with the rare disease communities, they want more sharing, less privacy, more photos, and uh, really uh, in order to um, have more uh, and specific diagnosis, even a, 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 a name for their disease, they do not want the um, treatment that they are currently receiving by ethics committees. However, um, most privacy policies are still protectionist and based on hypothetical, what if someday, somewhere, someone, somehow does X? And they talk about possible re-identification scenarios and so on. And what is needed is, I think, what will happen with the new general data protection regulation here in Europe is proof of a reasonable likelihood of re-identification, a reasonable likelihood of data breach, a reasonable likelihood of data misuse. This more proportionate approach, I think, is better suited um, to data-intensive science than zero tolerance based on hypothetical risk. Patient engagement also grew, and patents, in fact, were sought often by the rare disease groups themselves. Websites sprung up, dedicated to sharing information, the patient as participant, the citizen as, uh, the patient as partner, the citizen as participant. And I think groups like patients like me exemplify this new trend. This road to what is now called citizen science and to data access and data sharing it was not easy. Veronica mentioned the, the Public Population Project in Genomics and Society, which was founded in 2003 to prospectively 
ensure as much as possible future interoperability between biobanks around the world in order to achieve statistical significance and, uh, much more quickly. And locally, um, Cartagene, Quebec's population cohort, however, required the approval of 18 ethics committees. In fact, ethics approval took more time because it was a three-year project and the funding, as you know, ends and gets, goes back. It took more time for ethics approval than to do the science, which had to be rushed on the 24-hour, everyday basis at the last nine months of the project. The notion of genomics and populations using public funds and creating a resource representative of a modern a heterogeneous population for future unspecified research was considered by the ethics committees as too novel and too dangerous. The Quebec ethics committees feared a hidden eugenic agenda and the possible revelation to people of unwanted genetic secrets, the data themselves capable of recreating the genetic self. Ultimately, and very ironically, Cartagene, however, had the largest and the highest rate of um, collaboration at 23% of any national biobank in the world. So what then became the uh, uh, biggest challenge was not the politics or the ethics, but coming to an understanding of an appreciation of the complexity of common diseases. Positive predictive value was often uncertain. Understanding susceptibility and probabilities influenced by multiple socioeconomic environment factors and so on seemed so much more complicated than Mendelian uh, genetics. And furthermore, there weren't very many success stories other than maybe uh, Herceptin of pharmacogenomics leading to treatments or uh, drugs. So how to communicate genetic risk, genetic probabilities, as opposed to genetic certainties? The recent 2015 gene editing breakthrough, as announced in Science, was preceded by the fourth decade of incremental but noteworthy emerging technologies, ex emphasizing expanding once again individual genetic choice. The sum total of these individual choices illustrate a shift in their social acceptability. Indeed, non-invasive fetal cell sorting, embryo selection with pre-implantation genetic testing of embryos, like prenatal testing before it, largely place these genetic choices out of the public eye and into the privacy of the physician-patient relationship. The logic of this freedom of reproductive and genetic, uh, genetic uh, choice was underpinned by expanding abortion rights and reproductive choice. So in the absence of reprotect legislation or very clear professional guidance on clinical choices, would the same range of freedoms of reproductive choice now with gene editing apply to embryo selection or even treatments of humans as it had to prenatal choices? Before I turn to, uh, briefly to gene editing, Two other scientific innovations challenged um, the logic of these new quality of life choices. The first was the possibility of enhancement, especially as concerned gene therapies in, for example, the growth of muscle mass. And by the way, I chair the WADA Ethics Committee and gene editing is, has been added as a prohibited method as of October 2nd uh, under the WADA list of prohibited uh, methods. The second, as we heard earlier, is the arrival of epigenetics. Epigenetics involves understanding the basic mechanisms of cell differentiation and cell identity. But today, the emphasis is moving to environmental epigenetics. And so, risks reverting us back to sociobiology, as we heard in one of the questions that was asked. Some people even have compared it to acquired heredity. Moreover, a deterministic reading of epigenetics may create the impression that individuals, their health and their behavior are bound and ruled by the epigenetic marks they have acquired early in life, thereby ignoring social conditions. Indeed, a failure to acknowledge the greater complexity of social life might lead environmental epigenetics to contribute possibly unwittingly 
to perspectives that frame poverty and social disadvantage as something that replicates itself from generation to generation. So CRISPR. Well, CRISPR <laughs> has left the policy world, world gasping for air. And this is in part due to the fact that the criminal bans of 20 years ago, the criminal bans on genetic germline modification foreclosed what should have been ongoing debate. Politicians and the public were mollified and appeased and thought that the question had been settled and that was it. However, the arrival of uh, uh, CRISPR now has created a whole new world of metaphors um, and re that reduce complexity and exaggerate the control of outcomes. So for teaching purposes, what I did in 2016 was take the magazine covers of respected journals, and not, not down to your tabloids, of the most popular ones used, um, and you'll see these metaphors, which I will show you now. Erase nature. Engineer, MIT Technology Review. Exterminate, Wired. Edit, The Economist. Evolution, as since CRISPR goes to animals and plants as well. Eugenics, The Spectator. Enhancement, Orphan Black, and there's tons of films. Experiment, Time Magazine. Eliminate, which actually was hidden in an article uh, on uh, advance, uh, uh, enhancement. So what we need are metaphors for CRISPR that indicate the technology's uncertainties and the unknowns, that convey its value for current basic research and potential clinical and public health benefits. But metaphors should accurately represent how the technology actually works and can be used, avoid reductionist effects, and allow for an understanding of the complex bioethical implications. While today the potential and value of somatic gene editing affecting only the individual is beginning to be approved and recognized, in December 2016, an international summit in Washington proclaimed germline modification, that is, affecting descendants, as irresponsible. Three months later, however, the U.S. National Academies recommended that germline genome editing trials be permitted under very strict conditions and oversight. In 2017, in July 2017 of this year, 11 genetic expert societies joined the American Society of Human Genetics in its statement on human germline genome editing to cautiously allow research in germline modification. This fall, the European Society of Human Genetics and the European Society of Human Reproduction and Embry Embryology also will approve both basic and preclinical research regarding germline editing in the situation of the transmission of high risk of serious disease. Moreover, if the goals of the research cannot be adequately answered on the basis of spare embryos, Provided that research embryos are necessary to reach the aims of scientifically sound and robust research, deliberately created embryos could be used as well. But you have to ask the question, will such pre-implantation embryo research and the solutions that are found and the selection that are made obviate the need for germline modification in adults as a form of therapy? Professional policy road roadmap is coming to some form of cautious consensus. At the 20th anniversary of the Council of Europe's Convention on Human Rights and Biomedicine, known as the Oviedo Convention, in Strasbourg one month ago, or even less, October 24th to 25th, there were calls to revisit this ban on germline modification, but quickly the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe declared it to be unethical. Recently, a landmark Lancet article on stem cells and regenerative medicine argued that the lack of global, effective global governance, particularly over unproven stem cell therapies, needs to be remedied with more regulation, not less. Indeed, this recent convergence of stem cell uh, research and therapies with genomic research is creating a field that could be called cellular genomics that merits uh, watching, close watching. 
So, in conclusion, will the incipient liberal or neogenetics of choice or the new, what Judith Dar has called economic eugenics, hold sway? My first immediate answer would be that of my introduction. The judicious use of this term um, reminds us and serves to remind us of past, present, and future dangers of the effects of untrammeled political state programs or individual choice. The Nuremberg Code, the bioethics frameworks, professional self-regulation via guidance, and state intervention via legislation have shaped and continue to shape the trajectory of reproductive and genetic choice. Gene editing, however, is forcing the topography of past and present eugenic choices into the limelight. Back we are after our 20-year ban of no discussion, no debate. How then to take the current regulatory approaches and reshape them into a more compelling and global framework? And I say global because I would like to show you something that I actually found myself, I'm not very technologically uh, abled. Um, I found a map uh, from a scientist in Montreal. Oops. This is a map of scientific collaborations from 2005 to 2009. And you can see there are whole continents missing here. That's 2005, 2009. Here is the map of 2014. If science then is global, then the frameworks that govern science have to be equally uh, global. So I maintain that in complement to the bioethics frameworks and laws, it's time to activate a human right that has hitherto lain largely dormant. The right of everyone to share in scientific advancement and its benefits. This human right to science, which is the shorthand, has its origin in the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It was made legally binding legally binding, which goes beyond a bioethics or beyond even a declaration, under the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights of 1966 that since then has been signed and ratified by 165 countries. Because of this public international law status, the content of this right has uni universal force and its legal actionability can reach beyond the moral appeals of bioethics. It imposes positive duties on states who are accountable to their citizens to respect and uphold this right. Until now, there have been limited efforts to develop this content. In fact, in that same article, there's cultural rights and so on, and which have received more attention. But in the context of biomedical and genetic research, if we activate, if we catalyze this right, it can build on the jurisprudence of other human rights, such as protection of health, procedural fairness, anti-discrimination, equitable access, privacy, and so on. Since the Nuremberg Code, the goal of biomedical ethics, and I heard it exactly 10 days ago at the Council of Europe, has been to protect the research participant, formerly known as the uh, research subject. The activation of this human right to benefit from science and its applications would harness bioethical principles to promote human health and not just focus on the potential or hypothetical harms of research, almost like a reverse burden of proof that sits on researchers when they try to go and get ethics approval. Perhaps the most immediate realization of this right to benefit would be through the acceleration of international data sharing and of open science. And while Article 27 of the Universal Declaration and Article 15 of the International Convention recognize in that same article, so the citizens have a right to benefit and creators and inventors have a right to be recognized for their work. So that's where the IP, the intellectual property and attribution comes in. But could we translate this right into, for example, a duty to share leftover residual samples after medical care? or perhaps contribute a minimal set of medical data in the healthcare sector and radically reform healthcare from a systems point of view. 
Indeed, research and medical care could be joined in feedback loops of data into a learning healthcare system with minimal risk and improved research-based care. Enabling big data, such big data, will also play a role in ensuring the survival of accessible and affordable care because now there will be targeted allocations of resources rather than waste. Medical care for modern populations requires data from diverse populations from around the world. So it is more data, not less, that will help us understand diversity and the scientific irrationality and futility of positive and negative eugenics. How then to combat simplistic linear approaches to policy making and the use of debate killing terms such as eugenics? The answer is probably as complex as human genetics itself. One month ago when I was at that meeting, some strange questions began to appear from the audience and the speakers. They were there to look at the Uvito Convention 20 years after it was enacted in 1997. Here's some of the questions. Does genetic exceptionalism in the form of genetic specific laws contribute to and even exacerbate stigmatization rather than prevent genetic discrimination now that we know that genetics factors plays a role in most common diseases? In other words, isn't just genetics part of the normal human condition? Can gene editing serve to alleviate the human burden of severe, incurable conditions? Should the Oviedo ban on gene modification be lifted? Well, international policymaking is messy, slow, usually a decade, and arduous. At this meeting in Strasbourg, the bittersweet nature of believing that persons are fundamentally good came to life in the surreal spectacle of watching Italian soccer players come onto the field that same day of that meeting in, on, a, in, on a program on television against their own right-wing fans. The Italian soccer players came on the field wearing T-shirts with a photo of Anne Frank. They asked for a minute of silence while reading aloud from her diary, citing her, quote, I somehow feel that everything will change for the better that this cruelty, too, shall end. A diary, the faith of a young Jewish girl in, in, in hiding, and the mass message of hope in humanity were juxtaposed into a living, surreal demonstration of the power of fighting the racist, if not eugenic, ideologies of their own soccer fans. So we return where we began. My lost doctoral thesis on surrealist poetry, hypothesized, hypothesized, what I had to, as its hypothesis, that the literature of suppressed, colonized people began by poets and artists in these colonies outperforming their masters in their own art form, then revolting via surrealist techniques to return to local indigenous lost forms of expression. And finally, moving past what was called protest literature at that time to more personal introspection and forms of expression. Ironically, the more highly personal the art form became, the more universal it became. And this is illustrated in the work of Derek Walcott, the Caribbean poet who was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1992 and who died earlier this year. Is this the route then for medical genetics as it moves from Mendelian to the genomes of diverse populations to personalized precision medicine? If so, the true appreciation of human diversity resides not in the sequence maps or notions of race and populations or even illusions of equality, but rather in appreciation for di of difference, of equivalence in risk. Variants are not mutations. And the flood of knowledge on new genome variation and the elasticity of their classification, benign, unknown, pathogenic, and so on, over time, could lead to an appreciation of difference as an indicator of health and of resistance, as much as of probabilistic susceptibility to disease. If that happens, the social control of eugenics is sure to be defeated by the very complexity and individuality of human life contributing to the genetic makeup 
not just of a family or a population, but of the human genome that is humanity. Advantage comes from adaptation and from appreciating and preserving diversity and difference within a social fabric that, while supporting equality of opportunity, recognizes equivalence and difference. This, however, does not preclude saving children from being afflicted with serious conditions. It is axiomatic that the recent Anne Frank story, that with this recent Anne Frank story, we return to the classical definition of eugenics, that of Francis Galton himself. Eugenics is the science which deals with all influences that can improve the inborn qualities of a race and also with those that develop them to the utmost advantage, end of quote. And Frank died in Bergen-Belsen. One of my Dutch aunts who was Jewish lost all her members of their family in Bergen-Belsen and she herself was sterilized. Hence, my personal aversion to the liberal use of the term eugenics in debate as a way of stopping unethically uh, further debate. Irrespective, while one could argue that untrammeled individual procreative and genetic choices constitute a disguised hidden form of incipient and insidious eugenics, I think we should reserve the term for state programmatic actions or inactions in terms of ensuring the quality and safety of the science behind the difficult and complex social and personal decisions that lie behind individual and parental choices. Russell Powell argues, it remains an open question whether on balance the risk of repeating past moral failures outweigh the benefits to be obtained and injustices to be avoided by engaging in the large-scale modification of the human genome. Even if morality demands that we make germline modification technologies available to healthcare consumers, and even if parents have a moral obligation to avoid creating offspring with avoidable gene-based diseases, it is entirely separate question whether this obligation should ever be coercively enforced by the state. While agreeing with the latter part of this quote as concerns state eugenics, procreative beneficence, with its obligation on parents to provide the child with the best life in the form of dubious enhancements, is not the same as preventing harm to children in the case of severe diseases. And even then, it would be a personal and free moral choice, not a legal obligation. I would argue not for the creation or imposition of legal obligations or of genetic rights, but rather more international data sharing, more knowledge on individual and population complexity, and thus a greater appreciation of difference. Today, in genetics, information is often the treatment and will be for some time as we try to develop gene therapies for debilitating human diseases. Thus, as I wrote in 1991, the education and participation of medical practitioners and of the public are crucial. Such education and participation will serve to situate the locus of the communication and control of individual choices in genetic medicine, not in the molecular biology lab, but in the physician-patient relationship. This relationship is the ultimate insurance against state eugenics and against the emergence of the language of genetic rights. Only then will the equation between genetic revelation and apocalypse, between genetic information and discrimination, between the person and the disease be erased. So I conclude by quoting Derek Walcott in his last book called Morning Paramint. Everywhere is wrong, as all forms misperfection, hence the mask in which the whole society is based. Eugenics is about perfecting human life and therefore wrong. True appreciation of the complexity and adaptation of humans and humanity defies attaining such perfection. Thank you. be debating about this for a long time to come. It's my uh, great pleasure now to present you with the uh, golden plate. And it's a silver dish which was designed by Leslie Durbin.
Uh, he also designed the Queen's Head for the uh, Jubilee Medal and the reverse of one pound coins in the 1980s. But much earlier than that, in the 40s, he decorated the Stalingrad sword, which was given by Churchill to Stalin to um, commemorate the uh, sacrifice of the citizens of Stalingrad. Um, so he's quite high profile. He had uh, a one-man exhibition at Goldsmith Hall. Uh, and so his work is very collectible now. Uh, and uh, he designed this, and we have them made at regular intervals, uh, a few at a time, to present each year to our Galton lecturer. So it's my great pleasure to present it to you. Thank you.